Hello and welcome to the Vinyl Den, your channel for record collectors by record collectors. I'm Ian, and I figured I would uh, put together a little video since Nick and I have had a hard time working our schedules together, you know, adulting, all that shit. Um, so I've been kind of absent from the recent uh, posts. So I thought I'd just throw something out there. Um, I didn't get a chance to go to Record Store Day with Nick this past Saturday. The uh, I had to work, and I know he worked too. He gets off at 3 in the morning. I get off at 7 in the morning. I probably could have made it, but I had to go back at 7 that night. And to be completely honest, I'm getting really too old to be uh, pushing my uh, my limits that way. Um, I don't like to admit it, but unfortunately it's true. So I figured I would do kind of a two-parter. I would do um, kind of a some of the – just a couple of the records that I've picked up aside from that – um, recently, and then do another little uh, kind of retrospective thing. So um, let's get into it. First off, I've got uh, this is kind of a, um, an oldie but goodie. I uh, I picked this up. This is Iron Maidens Somewhere in Time. Uh, this is a 2014 pressing. Um, uniquely, they're a lot of their they're repressing all pretty much their entire catalog. This is the only one that I know of that isn't pressed in the U.S. This is a, a European pressing, and I don't know why. I don't know why this specific album was like that. It wasn't even. I, I don't even see this in the stores that often. Um, I think I maybe have seen it once, whereas I can find some of their other repressings quite easily. Um, this this one this is kind of the the album that started it all for me, and it's. It was solely based on the album cover. I mean, as you can see, Iron Maiden is, is well known for their, their cool album covers. And I think it what helps is that they've got the the mascot, something that you don't see very often in, in music. I think Megadeth kind of has their little version of it, and um, I always liked uh, Blues Traveler. It's not really a mascot, but they've got the little, uh, I call it the beatnik cat, the, the uh, beat poet cat with the cigarette and the black sunglasses. Uh not really a mascot, but it's kind of the cool. I, I, it's very unique to Iron Maiden. Eddie is even if people don't know Iron Maiden, they're gonna recognize the character, even if they don't know his name. They'll recognize that character. He's kind of become synonymous with their with their album covers. And this album, like I said, the, the, I was probably about eleven or twelve when I picked this up, and I bought it on cassette. Convinced my mom to buy it for me. Never really listened to Iron Maiden before, and even at that age, I did, it didn't connect to me as much as it does now but i could definitely tell that there was a uniqueness to their sound that wasn't present in a lot of bands of their time their contemporaries uh, like judas priest and even like ozzy and his solo stuff and alice's stuff you know the other hard rock bands and arts artists that were around at that time very unique because there's, there's an operatic element to their to their music and it, it probably relies heavily on the fact of bruce dickinson's vocals because their early albums with their original singer, which I can't remember his name, weren't, weren't as broad as as the later recordings were when Spruce Dickinson came in. Um, and there's a certain, I wouldn't call these concept albums. I mean, they, there's conceptual elements to them. This one especially uh, has a kind of a cyberpunk, as you can tell from the cover, cyberpunk, Blade Runner kind of um, motif going on. And there's there's themes that that lie within the songs but i wouldn't necessarily call them concept albums but i like the fact that there's conceptual elements to how the artwork relates to the music uh so yeah the somewhere in time it, i don't it's hard to recommend iron maiden to a lot of people because their their sound is very different from anything else you can find people who don't necessarily like metal but could like iron maiden there's people who maybe don't even like metal at all who might like Iron Maiden. And then also, also their the reverse is true. Their sound is, is unique enough where it doesn't fit with hard rock and some other heavy metal acts of their ilk. Uh, I, mean, I, I have to be honest, there's no record in this. I actually, it's on the turntable. I just finished listening to it right before I started recording. I haven't even had a chance to put it back in the sleeve yet because uh, this is just, it's just a, a great album. 180 gram, 2014 repressing, European repressing. I'm going to look into that and see what, why specifically this album is 
not pressed in the U.S. I mean, not that it matters to me, but it was a little bit harder to find. It's you don't like I said you don't see it in the stores as often as some of their other titles like you know Number of the Beast or um, Fear of the Dark. Those kind of albums. I have, I actually, I think I have Fear of the Dark. Picked that up a while ago though. Um, so yeah, it's somewhere in time. Iron Maiden picked it up. It's twenty nine bucks. It was it wasn't expensive. I, I think I got it on Amazon. I don't like ordering records necessarily, but with everything going on in the world, I don't get out much, and kind of ordering has been the way to go for me lately. Um, so yeah, Iron Maiden. I also picked up The Decemberist, The Tain, Five Songs. Now, what this is, is this is actually two EPs on one record. The Tain is one side, and then the five songs are the other. The Tain is one song. It's 20 minutes long and kind of in five parts. I think probably done as a uh, byproduct of the uh, digital age with streaming and everything else because it's a lot harder to stream an 18-minute song than it is five, you know, three, four-minute songs. So so this is so good. The Decembers is another band. It's, it's They're kind of hard, hard to recommend because they're, they don't necessarily fit in with the standards of what you would consider rock or other you know mainstream subgenres they they kind of they kind of cover the 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 gambit they they're progressive they're folk they they even got pop not so much in this on their last studio album it's very a very pop album i'm not sure i like it as much but i can see why they're what they're doing they're just expanding their sound kind of experimenting with other things and and it works another thing i like about them is their songs are very story driven you don't always know exactly what the story is but there's like a folklore element to the way their their lyrics are, are presented um and a lot of times in, in in the ways that the songs are even sang but um the lead singer sings 99 percent of the music but there's a, a female vocalist who kind of fits in or fills in other characters in a sense almost like i said more of a folklore kind of a a style and very acoustic but a lot of rock too there's there's rock there like i said their last song was pop kind of popish not a lot of acoustics going on there but yeah folk progressive even um the tain i mean like i said it's one song that takes up a whole side of the album that's something that i'm not familiar with happening outside of the progressive rock uh, arena, you know, Jethro Tull with Thick as a Brick, and um, Yes with uh, Close to the Edge is another song that takes up a, a, a whole side of an album. Everson Lincoln Palmer with Tarkus. The song Tarkus takes up one side of the album. So it's very progressive in that sense. The instrumentation, just fantastic. Another thing I like about these guys, they and I don't know if this is unique to them. I don't think it necessarily is. It's unique to them in the sense of kind of the, the, the vast majority of artists that I listen to. But a lot of times EPs, when an artist puts out an EP, it's either demos of their songs that are on, studio, on their studio albums or it's kind of like a single where it's got the, uh, a hit single from their album and maybe one or two unreleased tracks. The Decemberists, they put out EPs like records and they're the vast majority of them are all just songs that aren't on other albums. So their, their EPs are very kind of, um, in a sense, works of themselves. They're like releases of themselves because they're unique. They don't have, they're not songs you're hearing on, you know, it's not one song on five different albums and, and five different versions of it. It's all songs. I think they even kind of write it and release it as, write it, record it, and release it as, you know, oh, let's put out five songs kind of a thing. And I think that's, it's probably more common in the hip hop and rap arena because a lot of hip hop artists will do one or two songs and just drop them. And I mean, in the, in the digital age, it's a lot easier to do. Uh, but the December have only been around since 2003. So, I mean, they're, they're part of the digital age as well. And I think a lot of hip hop artists are putting their stuff out on, on vinyl anyway as well. So it's probably more unique with, with, as I said, hip hop and, and rap to, to do that not very common in in the rock arena so and i mean as an example this i i, I didn't just get this i've had this for a while but this is another example of the decemberist this is a 10 inch that i've had for eh, about three months four months now um this was released 
after their last studio album. And it's very much not pop. It's more in tune with their other stuff, but it's still different. And it, uh, it's got five songs on it. It's 10 inches. This is one I've listened to like six times because it's an easy one to just, you know, you come home and wind down. You throw a quick uh, 25 minutes just to, you know, kind of clear your head before you lay down and go to bed. Especially in those days when you have a very short turnaround. Uh, so, yeah, check out December. I They're quickly becoming one of my top tier bands. I don't, it's hard to, it's hard to quantify. Jethro Tull is always going to be my favorite band. And I think Counting Crows are always going to be my second, but the rest is kind of fluid. You know, anything after that can, it is going to alternate based on my taste and mood of the day. So, but the Decemberists are kind of working their way into that, say top 10 above and beyond Jethro Tull and Counting Crows. Cause they're, that's it. They're, those are my two favorite bands. They're always going to be my two favorite bands. And then the other bands are kind of, like I said, going to be fluid and, and adjust based on mood. And Decemberists are definitely in the top 10. Uh, and they, they probably always will hold a place there because they're just fantastic. Um, but yeah, those are a couple of the, the newer things I've picked up. And not a lot. I've been really kind of trying to rein myself in on spending not as successfully as I would have liked. As I said, I've been ordering stuff, so it's, you know, it's a lot easier to, to spend money when you're not really seeing it leave your wallet, uh, when you're just ordering it out and ordering shit online. Um, so, but I, I do I do hope to get out to the record store maybe this week. There's a couple of record store day uh, albums that I'm hoping I might be able to catch as leftovers. Not very likely. It's primarily just that Fleetwood Mac one that Nick mentioned in his video, and then um, I've been kind of going back and forth on a Charlie on the Charlie Mingus release that came out. Um, he's a jazz player. Uh, he's really good. I I was kind of wanting that soft parade, but after Nick's review of the packaging and everything, and I thought it was the whole album. It's not. Eh, I'm not really sure about that. Um, if they have it and it's not that expensive, I'll probably pick it up. But it's not one I'm like you know freaking out about. But that rumors I'm cur very curious about, and that Charlie Mingus I'm very curious about. Like I said, I wanted to kind of do a double take because I really haven't been um, contributing to the content of the channel lately. And, you know, Nick's been kind of holding everything down on his own successfully, too. Um, but I would say it was probably maybe one of our, one of the first videos we did. It was probably the first, within the first three or four we did, where we talked about box sets and whether or not there, there was value in them above and beyond a fan's value to them. And the one that stands out for me is, it stands out mainly because of, of what it offers. And this is the 20th anniversary box set of Jethro Tull. It was a five-disc set. It came out in 1988. It came out on all media platforms of the time. So it was vinyl, cassette, and CD. My dad bought the CDs. I, obviously, I'm, I'm not a cassette guy. Even when I was buying cassettes, I just cassettes were not my thing. They were convenient, and that was the thing of the time. It was easy, and vinyl was kind of disappearing. CDs were a little bit more expensive, and I was younger. Uh, I didn't even have a CD player until I was 12, 13. So I never really owned this. I, I just made, co made cassette copies from my dad's CDs, and I had those. But when I saw this, I, it's kind of a funny story. We were, Nick and I were at Encore Records in Ann Arbor. And he picked this up and was looking at it. And I was watching him look at it. And I'm thinking, eh, he's probably going to buy that. And I, I, was, I saw it and I was like, I, I want that if it's in good condition. And he was looking at it and looking at it. And he puts it down. So I picked it up and I looked at it. I mean, it was really good condition. I was amazed at how, how good the condition was. And I bought it. And I, it's kind of one of those little like inside jokes because... I paid thirty. Unfortunately, the sticker's still on it. I don't. I don't want to rip it off because. Oops, can't see it. Um, because I don't want to damage the packaging. I hate that the sticker's on there. Luckily, it's on the back. But I paid thirty-seven seventy-four for it, and I think he paid a little bit more when he went finally did buy his copy. But his copy was in really good condition too. Um, but really, what stands out about this? Now, this came out in nineteen eighty-eight. At the time, box sets were not big. Uh, my mom's husband at the time was a big vinyl collector. Uh, he had just picked up a box set. It really, it was in a box set. It was just, I think it was a double or triple album set, but it was um, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band Live. And I remember there being a lot of hubbub about that. And he also picked up the Eric Clapton box set. I don't know what was involved there too. There got a lot of hype too.
But I, I, I remember there being a lot of talk on radio, specifically about this box set, mainly because of all the unreleased material that came with it. Um, it's got 65 tracks, and I want to say damn near 60 to 70% of these tracks are unreleased, um, which is unheard of. And at the time, even now, and especially now, when, they, when an artist or a record label puts out a box set, they're going to put out the stuff that people are going to know because they think that's what's going to sell. But if you find, if you're fine, if you really want to market your box sets, your specialty stuff, the stuff that's going to cost a little extra money, I think you really want to put some effort into it. And that this is a this is, in my opinion, this is the standard bearer for box sets. And this came out at the time when box sets were just just really kind of starting. You get so much out of the unreleased material because you get a you can get a sense of what the artist was kind of thinking because you know when these songs were recorded and the their um, brothers and sisters of the time song wise how much different they are or how similar they are and you know a lot of these songs don't end up on the records it has nothing to do with the quality it's more about how they sound and where how they fit in thematically with the, with the other recordings and sometimes it could be that you know a song that they decided to keep off was recorded at the early stages of the the sessions and by the time they got into the groove of recording it just everything was kind of going in a different direction and there's a lot of examples of some really good songs some songs that are in my opinion superior to songs that ended up on studio recordings or studio releases um and this was also the first time that you got to hear a little bit of the Chateau Disaster tapes. Uh, Tull had gone to Switzerland in late 72 to record their follow-up to Thick as a Brick. And it, it was wrought with a lot of problems. Technical problems, health problems, just being in a foreign land because they were uh, British-born. And they were in, recording in Switzerland. They recorded three sides of, of a double album and then just decided to hell with it. They scrapped the whole thing. I mean, obviously they didn't throw it out, but they just stopped. And they went back to England and just re-recorded the material. They started all over. They didn't even re-record it. They rewrote and recorded the material uh, and condensed a lot of the thematic elements into uh, just a single disc instead of doing a double album. And I know there's a lot of argument about that specifically because when this came out in 1989 or 88, those a lot of that material was incomplete so specifically flute because what at least at the time their their standard for recording is the band would record ian would record his musical parts specifically with acoustic guitar and he would then go do his vocals and then he would do the flute parts so and i from what i understand when they did this, a lot of the vocals were done with the band element, but obviously the flute parts were going to be put in later. So the flute parts on these the three tracks that are on here from the Chateau Disaster tapes were flute that was re-recorded in 1988 for to complete the songs because it's easy to do. You don't you're not really hiding anything when you do that when you're you know recording something at the age of 28 and then going back at the age of 41 and trying to add to it or complete it, it's not going to work. You can't, vocally it wouldn't work. So there's, obviously there was record, there are parts of the recordings that had no vocals at all. And it would be very difficult, especially for Ian Anderson, because his voice has not aged. It, it, it started aging around that time. Um, it would be very difficult for him to re record vocals to complete the recordings in 1988 to match from 1972 and 73. So it just wouldn't work. So there's a lot of argument about that. And when, in 93, when they did their 25th anniversary box set, which I have up here, but that was all CDs. It's something I'll talk about it in another video because this is a vinyl show. We'll do CDs once in a while. We, you know, need a little filler episode. Um, but come now 40 years on, 40 plus years on, when Steve Wilson remixed the Chateau Disaster tapes, uh, which were, again, I'm sorry, were released in 93, the, 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 the rest of them with new, new flute added to complete the works and using the flute as a substitute for vocals that were not recorded in 72, 73, which I love. I love the, that 
93 version of Chateau Disaster. When Steve Wilson came in 2013 to uh, remix and remaster the Chateau Disaster tapes, he left all that out. He wanted it to sound as it did in 1972-73, which is respectable, but it, it's it's hollow. And that, that could just be a, a tall fan's ear. Hearing a lot of, of tall music that has no vocals and no flute, it, it's, it, it feels a little weak and it feels a little empty. But there is a lot of debate amongst tall fans as to whether which version is better because some consider it not the same if it's added you know, 25 years later. It's not the same recording. I see it as just it took them 25 years to, to finish the album, and that's the, the product that we get. And I, I, as I said, I prefer the flute. It's so good in the Chateau Disaster um, recordings for that, that were eventually released, released in 93. But I kind of went off on a sidetrack there. This was the first experience we had with, with some of that unreleased music. That was huge. And I, really, as I said, I remember there being a lot of talk on the radio about the uniqueness of this particular box set. Uh, some a couple songs that were recorded during the Aqualung sessions that never no one had ever heard before. And then there's a lot of elements of, of these unreleased songs that had shown up in live performances, you know, little interludes and maybe guitar solos that Martin would do that um, people would hear and go, wow, that's that's new, what is that? But it wouldn't be on any albums. Uh, Kelpie is a good example. That's on here. This is the first time that that was presented to the to the fan base. And the instrumental bridge that's in that song had been used a lot in the live recordings from 78 or not live live performances from 78 79 so that it was just such a great package and like i said this is kind of the 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 package by which i judge all other box sets so yeah pick this up if you're a tall fan i think you're if you're even if you're like um i wouldn't say a casual tall fan but a tall fan but not a you know overblown like tall fan like me you pick this up, you're going to hear some music that is, you're going to say, oh, I get it now. I get why Tull is, has the fan following they have. Because it goes above and beyond the aqua lungs and the bungle in the jungle. and You know, the, the songs you can hear on Sunday morning classic, well, now oldies radio any, any, anywhere in the world. But anyway, uh, that's all I got. Hopefully this, you know, makes up for some of my absence. Uh, then again, some of you may not even care that I show up at all. Who knows? But I do want to say, you know, our, our show is doing really well on YouTube. And I I really, we, we both appreciate the, the following we're starting to develop. You know, and we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you want to hear from us. So we can refine the show, do it so that it, it suits everybody. And, and um, I really want to say thank you to everyone who's subscribed, um, everyone who's even just watched, whatever. Um, and then the um, a couple of the other kind of record record related podcasts out there who have even come across us and mentioned us and uh, 33 RPM is one that they did a video they covered Nick's um, his collection and his setup and I thought they did a really good job and they were really really nice about doing that and um, and we we appreciate it we, he and Nick and I have been doing a podcast for f- almost four years now. And we just started the Vinyl Den this year, and the response to the Vinyl Den has already surpassed anything the podcast has done. We're still doing the podcast, but you know, this we're like I said, we're getting a lot of good um, good response to this, and we want to keep it going, and we want to want to make sure that you all are getting what you want too. So let us know. Uh, put your comments down below. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe. You know, and uh, check us out whenever. You know, we're on YouTube. We're there. We're in the we're in the world wide web. We're not going anywhere now. So, all right. Talk to y'all later. Peace. Mm-hmm.